Today, President Trump saying the government will accelerate testing of drugs that could treat the coronavirus. The FDA, however, saying not so fast. Meg Terrell joining us with more tonight. Meg, what can you tell us? Hi, Scott. Well, it wasn't even so much that the president said they would just accelerate testing. It's that he seemed to imply that they had actually approved two drugs to treat COVID-19. The FDA commissioner then quickly stepped up to the podium at that same briefing and said just minutes later, no, they haven't approved anything and they don't want to be giving false hope to people. But what they are saying is that they are trying to expedite testing as much as they can and they focused really on two drugs. One is called chloroquine. It's a decades old drug that's been used for malaria and it has shown some potential promise in very early studies in COVID-19. The other is a drug called remdesivir. That's an antiviral drug from Gilead Sciences. Wall Street's been paying a lot of attention to it, and Gilead's stock has gone up quite a bit uh, as a result of that. It's currently in five clinical trials around the world, including three in the United States, and we do expect to see the first results from those clinical trials uh, in April. That's from a trial in China. Now, in terms of chloroquine, a couple different companies make this. Bayer said today it was donating three million tablets to the U.S. government for potential treatment, and Myelin said it's ramping up its production at a West, uh, West Virginia manufacturing facility to be able to supply this as well. But we need to see the results of clinical trials to actually know if these drugs work, Scott. There's a lot more in the pipeline, of course, too, that we've been following. Uh, so we should expect to see uh, more data coming uh, over the next weeks and months. Back Appreciate that very much. Meg uh, Terrell, thank you so much for your reporting tonight. Let's bring in now Dr. Jeremy Faust from Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He's an instructor at Harvard Medical School as well. Dr. Faust, it's good to have you back with us. Thanks for having me back. Let's consider, uh, continue this, this conversation about the drugs. I want you to listen specifically to what President Trump said today at this news conference, and we can react to it on the other side. Normally, the FDA would take a long time to approve something like that, and it's, uh, it was approved very, very quickly, and it's now approved by prescription. So the important news here, as Meg was saying, this is not approved by the FDA for use with COVID-19. The FDA commissioner coming at that same news conference and saying it would only be given in the context of a clinical trial. Dr. Fauci himself, America's doctor at the moment, if you will, has been much more measured. Tell us what your thoughts are about chloroquine. Well, I won't say particularly about this drug because the whole point of doing clinical trials is to answer a question, does it work? And really, really smart people have hypothesized that something works for one condition or another, and then have been shown that it works under a microscope or it works under a Petri dish, but in people it doesn't work. I'll give you an example. We know that there are drugs that work for HIV, and they work great, and maybe they're going to work for coronavirus, but really smart people tried that, and it didn't work, and we have that from earlier this week. And so it's, the problem is we kind of downplay the, the possible downsides and, and only have the optimistic um, approach, like, oh, it, why not? But there actually can be harms, and that's why you do the studies, and that's what's actually un unfolding here. And I expect we're going to have really good information sooner than we ever would have, because the more important thing is that we are moving forward very quickly. That's the urgency. That's the thing that's really important, is that we can't waste time, but we have to do everything correctly. How optimistic are you about this remdesivir, as Meg was speaking? The president today saying the drug was, quote, essentially approved. Um, it is not. The trial results are expected next month. Big hopes? So here's the thing. Again, uh, it, it works beautifully in terms of a molecular mechanism. We know that it stops genetic chains from, from growing. And so that sounds like a really promising thing. But the question is, does it do it for this virus in a, very, in a way that's actually clinically effective? We don't know. But here's the, here's the news that I think is important. The trials are already underway. And one of the hard things about trials is to recruit enough patients that you can actually get good data so that you know you're not looking at a small sample size, that it's not just noise. And there are statisticians who can help us with that. And usually it takes months and weeks, weeks months and years before you have enough patients. The, the bad news and the good news is we're, we're going to have enough patients to try this on, so we're actually going to know something soon, much sooner than we would have if we weren't in a pandemic situation, which is what we need. We need to know those answers soon. I'm watching very closely. I've been disappointed in the past when things were hyped, and I've been pleasantly surprised when things that we, we thought, eh, don't have a chance, but have come through. So what I do is I go by the data. The phrase flattening the curve, it's in the American lexicon now. How do you feel about it tonight? What sort of progress are we making based on the pickup in testing that we're seeing? 
testing is rolling out much in much greater capacity than we had. It, I feel much better about that here in Boston. Mayor Walsh has been really great and, and on top of that. And I just see a lot of progress there. And, and we have to test more and more people so that we can track this virus. That is, the, that is the way to get this under control because uncertainty is the enemy, both for our own minds and for not knowing where the virus is and where it isn't, and also just for our own livelihoods to know what we can, what we can expect and really manage our expectations. Because right now, what everyone asks, they look to me and they, and they want to know what's going to happen. And, and I will tell them, you know, I don't know, but as soon as we have more data, we can make better, better um, not pro prognostications, but we can give a better sense of where we're at. Oh. And I still think that right now we're, we're not under control yet because we don't know enough, and there are hot spots that are hurting. I'm going to rely on your expertise and your guessing yet again. I saw a chart today that said deaths in Italy and Spain are increasing at a much more rapid pace than they did at China. Does that concern you about what might happen here? So that's a great question. And what we're seeing around the world is that the death rate and how quickly changes, not because the virus itself changes, although there is some theoretical basis to say, well, there could be a different strain here or a different strain there. I actually tend to think, and many of the experts believe this as well, that it has more to do with the randomness or circumstance, if you will, of who the virus happens to affect. So if it were to go through a college dorm, you would have a lot of people get sick, but they, the, but they wouldn't be that ill, possibly, or they, at least they, they would be much more expected to really be able to clear that virus. Whereas if it goes through a nursing home or a senior community, then you start to see these, in, these incredibly sad situations, which is sort of what I've been saying from the beginning, which is we've got to focus, we've got to play the ball. We've got to go to where it is and protect those people. Protecting older people is the number one priority. The rest of us can really be careful, but we have to protect the vulnerable. And I think that in places like Italy it's, it, and other places as well, where the death rate has been higher, it's been, it's been because we, of that population. We know the elderly are, are most at risk, though. There are increasing reports of young people in the hospital with serious lung illness. Yes, that's right. And here in the, in the United States, we're hearing that. And we're hearing numbers that sounds kind of scary because there's a certain number of young people right now who are comprising a higher percentage of hospitalized patients than we might have anticipated. But actually, if you think about that, that could be, in a way, the shadow of, a, of another piece of news, which is there aren't a lot of older people in the hospital. It actually gives you a piece of information that says, wait a minute. We were expecting old people, and now we're getting younger people. Does that mean that we're actually keeping this away from older people, which is the whole point of social distancing? That's unknown, but it certainly is consistent with that. And we know that some of these young people will have terrible outcomes, and that is what's going to really mess with our minds, to see that, because it's a couple of anecdotes, and it really hits home. But that's even the needle in the haystack. We see those on television, and we see them in our feeds. But to me, knowing that, goodness, uh, I'd much rather hear that most of the hospitalized patients are, are younger tells me that we're actually somehow protecting our elderly right now, and I hope that's why we're seeing that.